Hey guys, how are you this week? We want to talk about the new birth, regeneration, and the new creation, which are all essentially the same thing. You see, the church has this convenient formula that we are somehow to believe in order to get born again. Now, this comes from a conversation Jesus had with Nicodemus in John chapter 3, where Jesus is basically saying something impossible to Nicodemus. You've got to come out of the womb again. And then he starts talking about believing. And so we think that our faith is somehow the one good work that purchases our salvation the surcharge to salvation, the one good work that somehow supernaturally transforms us. But we haven't really looked at this whole thing in context, unfortunately. Okay, The church is great at taking these little sound bites and turning them into these big things. A number of translations say, not born again, but born from above. The key word here is anothen, which means born from above, from heaven, from the beginning, from the original source, original origin, or from of old, again, anew. That's a strong concordance, okay? So Nicodemus, Nicodemus, he says, how must I be saved? And Jesus says, be born again. Now, you know that you can't climb back into the womb, and we had nothing to do with our natural birth. When we were born naturally, okay, you were, uh, you didn't pick your parents, you didn't, you didn't force your way out of your mother's womb, you didn't pop yourself out, and in the same way, you do nothing uh, in regards to your spiritual birth. You were born from above, not by the will of man, but by the will of God. Born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, but of God. The scripture says this kind of stuff over and over. Jesus is telling Nicodemus, look, this is all God's doing. This is a gift. So Jesus says to essentially do something uh, impossible for you to do, be born. And we think, you know, that the next thing, however, that he says is possible. We We think that believing in Jesus is possible for us to do on our own, okay? I want to show you something here. People ask Jesus several times, how do I get saved? What must I do to get saved? And Jesus was extremely inconsistent with his answers. He never just made some easy pat answer. He never sent his disciples out and said, okay, boys, just go around and have everybody repeat this prayer. Simple as that. No, Jesus made it frustrating. He made it difficult. As a matter of fact, he made it confusing. Jesus was very inconsistent. When it came to the salvation business, he made it complex. He made it impossible. Do you remember when the rich young ruler came to Jesus and uh, he's asking Jesus, "What must think? What good thing must I do to get eternal life?" And Jesus said, "Why do you ask me what is good? There's only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments." He says, keep the law, don't commit adultery, don't steal, honor your mother and father. All the all the commandments. So Jesus says, "How do you get saved?" Keep the law. That's Matthew 19. And actually, the funny thing is, the rich young ruler, he says, well, I've, I've been doing pretty good at this stuff. He says, I, I, these things I have kept. What do I still lack? And Jesus then steps it up a whole nother notch. He takes it beyond the law. He personally tailors this man's recipe for salvation to make it personally impossible for him. So he says, okay, you want to be perfect? Sell everything you have and give it to the poor. He tells the rich young ruler, let's take it beyond the law. Okay, look how impossible this is. Sell all your stuff. That's what you want to do to get saved? Now, the rich young ruler, he walks off, and he's he's sad. He knows he can't pull this off. And the disciples are sitting there, and they're obviously thinking the same thing. Because they, they say to Jesus, they say, look, we've left everything, but they know that they probably didn't have anything uh, to begin with, okay, like the rich young ruler did. And so they're realizing how hard this is. They said, who then can be saved? And Jesus says, with man it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. And this, my friends, is the whole 
point. Salvation is God's business from start to finish. You want to get saved? Jesus says, keep the law. But you couldn't do that. The point of the law was to frustrate your attempt at saving yourself. The law eventually just causes sin to increase. Yes, the recipe for salvation is keeping the law, but it means keeping the law perfectly, and you couldn't do it. So Jesus did it for you. He fulfilled the law. But do you see the inconsistency? To the one guy, how must I be saved? The rich young ruler, he says, keep the law. But to this other guy, Nicodemus, how must I be saved? He says, believe. Now, Nicodemus should have known that faith, believing, is higher than the law. And he would have understood the faith of Abraham from the scriptures. I mean, Nicodemus was one of the top ruling guys. But Jesus, you have to see this, with this story in Nicodemus, uh, in John chapter 3, he is also personally tailoring a different recipe, but an equally impossible recipe for salvation that he gives to Nicodemus. To the one guy, he says, keep the law. To the other guy, he says, believe. Now, neither one of these could pull this off. Jesus knows that we cannot pull off faith on our own. He told the disciples over and over and over, you boys have no faith. You remember he said at one point, he said, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you could move a mountain. Now, I have led tens of thousands of people uh, in the sinner's prayer, right? But I've never seen a single one of them move a mountain before, okay? So we know that none of these people probably has ever even generated even one small minutia of faith. Here's the deal. Jesus was not saying to strain and pop a hernia until you can crank out a mustard seed worth of faith. Well, why don't we read the first part of that verse? He says, because you have so little faith, I said, if you did have as much as a mustard seed, you can move the mountain. The whole point here, Jesus is saying, you boys have no faith. Not a smidgen, not the tiniest little germ of faith. He's saying that even if you did, if you had the smallest little iota of faith, then you could take on hell with a water pistol. But the fact is, boys, you don't. You are hopelessly bankrupt in the faith department. Jesus was telling his disciples this all the time, right up to the point that he died. But remember, they said, oh, now that you're speaking to us clearly, right at the end of his death, he starts explaining some things. They said, now we believe. And Jesus said, okay, look, you boys believe jack squat <laughs> he said when they come for me you're going to be running for the hills you're about to scatter you don't believe anything see this is exactly what he was saying to nicodemus the ruling pharisee who was so dead broke in faith that he is slinking up to jesus in the middle of the night behind everybody's back so as not to ruin his reputation with the sanhedrin okay you want to get saved nick all right well forget all this cloak and dagger midnight rendezvous stuff you are going to have to put all your chips on red in the daylight. That's right. All your eggs in one basket. You're going to have to trust in me, Nick. That's right. The one you don't want to be seen with. The nut bar Sabbath breaker who spits in people's faces, breaks bread with mafioso tax collectors, the guy who ripped up the temple, the guy who told all you professionally religious guys that you're going to be the last to enter the kingdom right after the whores. Okay, that's right. You're going to have to trust in me, Nick. The glutton and the wine bibber. You're going to have to believe in me. No way was Nicodemus going to be able to pull that off. Look, nobody can keep the law and nobody can pull off perfect faith. Jesus was giving two recipes for saving yourself that are both equally impossible. Salvation doesn't just require a mustard seed of faith. Salvation requires perfect faith. Now, I'm not saying that faith isn't important, and I'm not saying it's, it's not important how you live in terms of the law, in terms of Ten Commandments or this kind of stuff. But the fact is we cannot pull off either one of these perfectly, and so Jesus had to fulfill the law for us in the same way that he had to have perfect faith for us. We are not saved by our faith. We are saved by the faithfulness of the Son of God. Every single verse in Scripture that talks about faith in Christ, scholars now overwhelmingly agree they should be translated as the faith of Jesus Christ. Yes, faith is the avenue of our salvation, but Jesus' fulfillment of the law is also the avenue of our salvation. It's all about him. Our righteousness but must exceed that of the Pharisees. Only he could give us that. In the same way, our faith has to be perfect. Only he can give us that. You don't self-generate the new birth. You experience it. You cannot self-generate the new man. You cannot climb back up into the womb. All of humanity, 
was included effortlessly in the incarnation, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He is the one who changed our substance and our identity. Faith is simply the lens by which we can see that and therefore manifest that. So how does faith come? It comes by hearing. By hearing what? That it is finished. I'm not saying that it isn't impossible. You could, Of course, anybody can reject their true identity. Of course, you can reject the truth of your new birth, but that does not negate it. You can exclude yourself, but you can't stop him from including you. You see, the new birth is not about some self-generated experience. The new birth is all sourced in what happened in the incarnation, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Thomas Torrance, the theologian, was once asked, they said, when were you born again? And he said, I was born again 2,000 years ago when Jesus came out of the virgin womb, when he stepped out of the virgin tomb. Now, people get mad when you start to mess with what they, they deem the conversion experience because they think the conversion experience is the thing that regenerates you. And I, I, I don't want to challenge all of our idolatrous ideas of being born again. And I know that that's touching the Holy Grail. You know, people say, just believe. And I'm not trying to confuse your system here. I know you think that's simple, just believe. But I would argue that your currently accepted regiment for salvation is confusing enough, okay? What does that mean, just believe? Do I pray a sinner's prayer? Do I pray and believe? How do I know I believed enough? Do I pray and believe and repent? Is repent changing the mind? Is repent changing the actions? Do I believe to the point of having a goosebump? Do I believe unto the point that my life changes? How much change is enough? Do I... Do I stop snorting coke? Do I stop snorting coke and hanging out with hookers? What if I only snort one line of coke instead of seven? What if I only have one hooker instead of seven? You see, it's me, 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 me. What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And you see, you never see evangelicals holding up Matthew 19 posters at the football game. You know, how do I get saved? Keep the law. Sell all my stuff. But what they do is they hold up John 3.16 posters. Believe in Jesus. The problem is these evangelicals know that it's impossible for them to keep the law, but they still think that it is possible for them to generate faith. Let's talk about this, the word regeneration. What does it mean to be regenerated in Christ? The word regeneration is used only twice in Scripture regarding Christ's saving act in Titus 3.5 and then again upon his return in Matthew 19.28. Okay, it is never used in the sense of an individual's personal altar call experience. Thomas Torrance, he said the following. He said, it is significant that the New Testament does not use the term regeneration, palagonesia, so often as modern evangelical theology does for what goes on in the human heart. It is used only of the great regeneration that took place in and through the incarnation and of the final transformation of the world when Jesus Christ will come again to judge the quick and the dead and make all things things new. That is to say, the gospel speaks of regeneration as wholly bound up with Jesus Christ himself. The new birth being synonymous with regeneration is not about what happens in our individual hearts. Yes, our hearts are awakened to this reality when we hear, when we trust. But even Paul did not point to his experience on the road to Damascus as a conversion experience. Rather, he referred to it as a calling. Torrance also says this. He says, conversion is not an emotional experience or a radical change in heart as the repentant sinner tearfully trods the sawdust tree trail beneath the billowing dome of the revival tent. It is about what happens in the regeneration of the human mind in the incarnation. He says, may I suggest that we think of conversion Christologically rather than anthropologically. Now let me explain that. By saying we should no longer think anthropologically, Torrance is saying that mankind should not be looking within himself in what he called an interned notion but that we should be looking to Christ. Think of that. Wow, Christians thinking of Christ. Not just what he did, but who he is in the incarnation. You see, 
This is a matter of Christology, our understanding of the very fabric and nature and person of Jesus Christ himself. You see, in his very substance, in his very makeup, he is conversion. We've been so self-focused about what we have to do or what we have to say or what we have to believe in order to be reconciled with God that we have missed the fact of who he is. We're saying, do I have enough faith? Do I believe strong enough? Do I, di do I believe deep enough? Am I born again? What must I do? Me, me, me. And we've missed the simple fact that he himself is the reconciliation between heaven and earth. He is the God-man connection. Jesus Christ is the covenant between God and man. Jesus Christ is our human response to the Father. His person and his work are all seamlessly one in the same. Salvation was not merely an act he accomplished. He himself is salvation. Now, again, some people might say, you're complicating this. Simply believe and you'll be saved. Look, I'm telling you, you've complicated it already. You're standing on flimsy ground if you're trusting in your own ability to believe. We must see that conversion has been accomplished in a holistic sense for all of humanity when Christ took on humanity. And yes, there is an individual awakening to this when we agree with the truth. But what happens in the individual human heart, that, that's what that is. But we're not writing all that off. But your experience does not recreate you. Christ did. So what about people who don't see, you know, a certain amount of transformation in a certain amount of time that they think they should? H how do you know you've experienced enough to lock in your salvation? Maybe you're not snorting coke and buying the hookers over there, but are you walking through walls? Are you walking on water yet? How much experience is enough if it's up to your personal experience? Experience is a very flimsy guide and a very flimsy ground for salvation. But when salvation is rooted in Christ, then your whole life becomes a continual experience. We're not against experience. We're against it in the salvific sense. Jesus has saved us into a continual experience. Every doctrine of conversion must be grounded in Jesus Christ himself, even to the point that he took our place in our acts of repentance and personal decision. For without him, so-called repentance and conversion are empty, Thomas Torrance says. He says, our conversion or new New birth is a sharing in the conversion of the human mind wrought in the healing assumption of Adamic flesh in the incarnation when Christ took it all into himself. Our new birth is a prior act of sheer grace whereby through no merit of our own we are given to participate in the conversion of Jesus Christ. We do not depend on our own decision for Christ as this throws men back upon themselves to be saved, effectually telling them that they are responsible for their own salvation. So what if we just stick to preaching the word? Because I'm telling you, all this other stuff is not in the word the way we think it is, okay? What if we just stick to the word that Christ came to save sinners and we decide to preach nothing but Christ and him crucified? And then when people hear that, boom, this ecstatic response of faith starts to leap up spontaneously without us having to command it. From the very moment of his virgin birth, Christ was beating back our old nature, converting humanity through his own struggle against temptation, his own fasting, his own persecutions, his own uh, sweating of great drops of blood. He embodied our repentance. He repented for us just as he was baptized for us. He was turning our nature back into submission to God. He received baptism from John, clearly not needing it for himself, but he was stepping in, becoming our conversion. So what about this future tense regeneration that the scriptures talk about in Matthew 19, 28, etc.? Christ Return is not a second work of somehow reaccomplishing something that he left unfinished on the cross. When he returns, the future will hold a, an unveiling of a full manifestation of the reality which was made real in his life, death, and resurrection. You see, nothing is holding us back from that manifestation right now. He finished it on the cross. But we are brimming with excitement because whether we're seeing it all or not, yet one day we will fully see, even if we don't see it now. So we can be excited now, but our waiting is not with frustration. 
We are pregnant with expectancy. All of creation standing on tiptoes for the full revealing of our identity, the full revealing of our sonship, fully awaiting that manifestation of our new birth. We're not waiting to be born. We are not waiting for adoption in the sense that it hasn't happened. We are waiting for the full disclosure of our adoption. We're already sons. We're waiting for, for that manifestation of our inheritance. We don't become sons. Rather, we wait to see the full thing uh, blowing up. We wait and long for open recognition as sons through the deliverance of our bodies, the Weymouth translation says. The message translation, it says that the joyful anticipation deepens all around us. We observe a pregnant creation. The difficult times of pain through the world are simply birth pangs, it says. In Romans 8, message translation, you see, we are enlarged in the waiting. The waiting doesn't diminish the pregnant mother, the me message translation says. We are, we are waiting to see that full manifestation of what he's already accomplished, okay? Again, let's look at this term, born from above. This is essentially saying, guys, we got to back it over. We got to start from the top. Literally, look back. Uh, to, the, to the beginning, to our original design, okay, back to the origin, our authentic blueprint. This is about renewal. This is about rediscovering the initial design of God for humanity, uh, of, of us being in union with Him. It's a restoration of the original creation. You see, the new creation and the old creation both originated in the heart of God as one seamless act, okay? In a sense, there are two creations, but in a very real sense, no, it's all been one seamless plan. The new was always intended to be a regeneration of the old. Jesus speaks of two births, saying unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom. There are two births, the natural birth, the, the, the broken water of the human womb, and the spiritual birth, born of the Spirit, born from above. First Peter 1, he says, you have been born again, not from a perishable seed, not from mortal sperm, not from human origin, but from the one that will live forever, immortal seed, because it comes from the eternal living word of God. Do you see how the new birth just like the new creation is the original creation that is rescued from the decay and the chaos of the kingdom of darkness. Our decision for Christ only has substance because of God's decision for us from the dawn of creation. Our faith is simply entering into saying yes to what God has already believed to be true about us. We must see Christ was, was present even in the old creation. It's all been his plan from day one. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. John 1, 1 through 3. Just as the old covenant was engineered to make a way for the new, so much we see, we must see the old creation was always intended to make a way for the new creation one seamless act. It was the inevitable consequence in the heart of God that the new creation should spring out of the old as a seed inevitably gives birth to something that is similar in substance, yet altogether more glorious than itself. That seed must die in order to bring forth new life. Evil was allowed to strike death, but only for the grand redemptive purpose of bringing back to life those that were dead, restoring creation to a state that is actually better than it originally was in the beginning. At the fall of Adam, God was not wringing his hands in heaven, caught off guard by mankind's failure and his subsequent perversion of his creation, okay? Contained in his original plan was the redemption of that creation. Mankind was made in the image of God. He was marred by sin, but mankind never lost his value to God. Just as the lost coin never loses any value in the parable. Just as the lost sheep may get lost, but the sheep never loses his value. God's plan was always redemption. So in a very real sense, 
There is but one creation. Old and new covenants are in one sense diametrically opposed, but actually they are the same because the old was paving the, na- the way for the new. So we perceive that the new creation in Christ it, we, is, is altogether uh, different from the old world, and indeed it is different, but you see it is always God's progressive design to transcend the old into the new through the broken body of the Son. And you see how creation was always woven into the fabric of Christ and how uh, the reconciliation of the universe was always the culmination of His divine strategy. What does it say in uh, Colossians 1, 15 through 20? I want to read you this. It says, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for in Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. The Apostle Paul, he was standing outside himself in ecstasy in 2 Corinthians 5.19, and he was literally possessed by the love of God because he recognized, quote, that one died for all and therefore all died. We all collectively participated in that death to the old self. And he says just a couple verses later, therefore if anyone is in union with Christ, he is a new being. The New Century Translation. Uh, Coneyberry says whoever is in Christ is a new creation. He is a new person altogether. Philip uh, J.B. Phillips Translation. The old era that was represented in Adam and the fall of humanity has been replaced by the new era of Christ and his kingdom. You are in a whole new realm now. You're grafted into something that is bigger than yourself. You are one with God. The crazy thing is that everybody else is grafted into this as well. It's just a lot of them don't know. The, The question is, do you realize what's happened? Do you realize what you've been grafted into? You have already are a new creation from his perspective, from his point of view. It's time that we recognize what he sees. Even if you don't fully recognize it yet, you're already in Included. Becoming a new creation is not about when you accept it. This is much bigger than your individual decision. Paul is speaking in this passage of how all have died in his death. And therefore, he says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. But quite often, people think this is a conditional if. If you come to faith, if you receive him, then you become a new creation. But this is not a conditional if. This is a conclusive if. He's saying all of you have died. Now, if you're dead, what does that mean? It means you are new. It's the same if, like in Romans 8, 31, if God is for us, who can be against us? So I love you guys. God bless you guys. You guys are new creations. I would encourage you to realize that. But uh, we love you all. And uh, let's just get excited. This is really good news. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Stop focus in on self, 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 and you'll realize there is no more self. You have been grafted into him. You have been co-crucified with Christ, and now you're participating in the life of God. God bless you. We'll see you next week. Hey, John Crowder, Dave Vaughn, coming to you from the Queens, England. This is normally where Slosh Fest has been held over the past few years, but Slosh Fest is coming to the USA. Why don't you tell them a little bit about what to expect this next month there, Dave? There's going to be a lot of heavy, drunken intoxication. I would encourage you all to get along to one of the events near you. It is going to blow up. We're going to be wearing our monk's robes for the first time in a couple of years. There's going to be just such an explosion of the glory of God. You want to join us. Make sure you're there. You're going to be carried out. We're going to be kicking off Operation and Mobilization all over again. I guarantee you'll need a wheelchair to get you out of one of these events. It's going to go wild. It's coming to Santa Cruz, California, Gadsden, Alabama. Fort Wayne, Indiana, and Delaware. So find one nearest your region. It's worth the trek. Bring a big batch of drunken people, and you can register online, sloshfest.com. Coming in November. Bye-bye, Bye-bye. guys.
Close your eyes. Did you know we have a fresh new schedule of mystical schools? Find out if one is coming to your region by visiting www.thenewmystics.com slash schools. Our only other school in the USA for this year will be in Portland, Oregon. We have several other schools kicking off at the start of the year. Alaska, Branson, Colorado, Hawaii and many more. Visit us online and be sure to register early as schools often fill up. Also, we have a special event coming to four regions of the United States in November. It's Sloshfest Reloaded with John Crowder and Davey Vaughan. Two days off your head in the new wine of the gospel for all you absolute nutters and glory tossers. Find the region that's closest to you and bring a caravan to the party. It's coming to the West Coast to California, the Southeast to Alabama, the Midwest to Indiana, then to the East Coast to Delaware. Space is limited, so register early. Sign up is only available online at www.sloshfest.com. And look out New Zealand and Australia. It's John Crowder's Down Under Joy Clinic coming to a city near you. This one is coming in November and December to Hamilton, New Zealand, Perth, Adelaide, Canberra and Sydney. Find out more at www.joyclinic.eventbrite.com.